Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Wandering Wildlife Society Wildlife Talks. Monthly talks will continue all next year. And uh, we are part of the Estes Valley Watershed Coalition. And we ask for donations so that your dollars can help us um, with grants. Our grants are uh, require matching funds occasionally. And what we're doing on those grants is we are doing uh, wildfire mitigation in our forests. We are planting vegetation along our rivers. This is all part of the effort that started in the 2013 flood to um, restore our watershed. Uh, tonight we have with us uh, Andy Ames, who is a naturalist, and he's going to talk to you about um, animal tracks and how to identify the tracks and what we can learn from the uh, about the animals themselves by looking at their strides. Right, Andy? We'll see. Okay. <laughs> All right. Enjoy it, everybody. Yeah. All right. Angle the camera up a little bit. And now I can. All right, is that okay? Yeah. Is that okay? All right. Yeah. All right, well, welcome. Um, today we're going to learn how to identify some common animal tracks of the Estes Valley, how they were formed, and what we can learn from them. Um, just a little background on how I got into tracking. I've had a lifelong passion for nature and wildlife, but once I moved to Colorado in 1984 and started trail running, Came easy to be immersed in nature on a daily basis. Whenever I'm out on the trails, I'm always on the lookout for wildlife. So if I happen to spot a deer or coyote or even a squirrel, it makes that my run um, or hike um, that much more memorable. And I feel more connected to my environment. Often these encounters are just a, a fleeting glimpse. So I would. Um, learn more about the animal when I got home uh, to get better acquainted with it. As exciting as it is to encounter or spot wildlife, however, I often wonder what they're doing the rest of their time and what might be going on in this place when I'm not there. After all, um, whether I'm running or hiking or anyone for that matter who's run running or hiking, you're only in one place for a very short time. When trail running, I spend a lot of time looking at the ground. Over time, I really started noticing how many other animals um, use the same roads and trails that I did, especially around here in Estes and in the Rocky Mountain National Park. Started learning more and more about the tracks. And now with a little imagination, I can visualize how a coyote is trotting down a trail, a mouse scurrying from log to log, or a deer uh, browsing on a bush. So I found that tracking can make our long winters a lot more enjoyable. Now, on days like today, or I look forward to getting out the morning after a fresh snow as each snow creates a fresh canvas. And it's always fascinating to see who's been out there and learning the story behind their tracks. So let's get started. So I rarely go out specifically to go tracking. I encounter, um, usually I just incorporate it into my um, runs and walks, but the morning after, after a, a snow, I'll always just look out the window, look at our driveway and see if there's any tracks right, right outside. So a um, few things, that's just part of being aware of your surroundings. So um, you just never know what you're going to see out there. So one thing you might want to um, wonder about um, is just where to go for tracking. And in the Estes Valley, we are just so lucky that 
we are, are surrounded and immersed in wildlife habitat. Um, just right out your door, uh, around every house, there's probably going to be rabbits, mice, um, deer, elk, frequent our neighborhoods, what, wherever you are in town. And a lot of those prey animals attract coyotes, um, bobcats, mountain lions, um, other animals um, that could be anywhere in town. So um, when to go? I like to go out first thing in the morning. Um, that way the tracks are a little easier to spot. You get the low, low angle of the sun, gives a little shadow into the tracks. And um, also you wanna get out before the tracks start to melt out, um, the roads are cleared or um, tracks are obscured by other people's tracks or, or other things. So what to bring? I usually um, don't really bring much special. I'll often run with my camera. Um, I've just got a, a small camera that I take with me, um, but a, a phone may, may be, do also. And then um, you may also, some people for tracking may consider taking like a small tape measure or just something to um, use for scale on the track. Um, I usually like to travel really light. So I'll just use my, my hand or my foot as um, for scale. And if needed, I can measure, measure that when I get, get home. But you always wanna look, look around. Um, you never know what you're gonna see, see out there. Um, and, but most importantly, is just to, if you do spot wildlife, be careful not to disturb it. If you're following tracks, um, always keep a look ahead. Um, just because sometimes you can get kind of focused on the tracks on the ground and may come up and um, end up chasing that animal uh, <laughs> while you're following. Instead of just following your tracks, you may end up actually put moving it beyond where it's, you know, it likes to be. So um, when you're out there, you may not be able to really identify every single track. As you can see, these are all mountain lion tracks here, and every one looks very different. Um, can be difference in the snow conditions, um, wind, the age of the tracks. Um, a lot of them will um, will turn to ice over time. You can see the like the uh, one on the far right, or a couple ones on the far right. Um, the wind has blown all the snow away from the track. Um, also consider um, when you're looking at a track, if you have a hard packed snow, like in the lower left hand corner, the um, track is gonna be pretty shallow and will look, um, give a little smaller um, impression to the track. And then of course, the opposite is also true. If the snow is really deep or soft, um, the track will, will look a lot larger. And also over time, um, as the track melts out, the track will get larger too. So um, let's look at how a track is actually made. So a track is a reflection of the animal's anatomy. So you can, there are three basic types of track, the plantigrade. So that's like a human foot where the whole foot connects to the ground. Digitigrade, where it's just the ball of the foot. So if you imagine standing on your tiptoes, that's um, you're just standing on the ball of your foot and balancing with your toes. And then the ungula grades, which would be the hoofed animals um, are just standing basically on your fingertips. So if you just imagine that hoof is essentially your finger, fingernail or your toenail, and then there is it's standing on also the pad of it, which would be essentially your fingerprint or toe print. So a foot is composed of three basic elements. Um, I kind of show, we're all familiar with what a uh, human foot looks like. So this is comparing um, the same, a lot of the same elements on a deer, deer leg. So, um, the digits would be the toes or fingers. You can see it as you can see in this picture. Um, and this is the rear leg of a deer. 
the metacarpals and metatarsals would be the foot bone. You can see that would be the bone between the toes and the heels. And then the carpals or tarsals would be equivalent. The tarsal would be equivalent to the heel of the foot. Carpals, um, you may think of carpal tunnel. That's, that's a um, part of your hand. So um, this continues on, same, same image, but now you can kind of visualize how that looks on, on a deer. This one is a mule deer here. And so all the hoofed animals will have that basically the same, same structure. Then we also have the digitigrades. So those are dogs and cats, and it also includes birds. So I'm not doing bird tracks in this um, presentation, but um, you can kind of imagine how those are, um, are formed also. So in this, this portion here, you can compare different parts of the anatomy of um, comparing it to like a human anatomy. So the heel would be well above the, um, the what's leaving a track on the, on the bobcat on the left. And then on the um, coyote on the right, you can see where that heel would be and then how it flexes the wrist on the front. So plantigrades, um, we're probably can relate to those the most since um, that's the type of print that we use, but also rodents, rabbits, weasels, raccoons, and also bears use that, um, leave that same type of footprint. So that's where it's leaving, the toes are leaving an impression, the ball of the foot, arch, and the heel, or, or what would be equivalent to the palm on the front. So you can also identify the families by counting the toes. So the angular grades, which would be the deer, are gonna have those two toes. Um, sometimes you'll also see the dew claws, which are former toes or um, evolutionary remnant. Those kind of show up and will be at the um, behind on the back side of the foot and um, may or may not show up in the track, but they do serve, serve a purpose still. Um, and then you've got the um, digitigrades, with, which include the dogs and cats, as we mentioned before, and then the plantigrades. So the plantigrades are gonna be the slowest of the animals, um, but, and the angulagrades will be the fastest. But you can also, um, from that anatomy, tell a lot about the abilities of an animal. So the hooves on an animal basically um, are great at supporting the animal. They're very durable. Um, and are very e efficient in, um, in running fast and covering great distances, as well as standing up for long periods of time. But they do have limitations. So um, if you going to the digitigrades, um, they've got, they're a little bit more, more versatile. Um, the dog, with the dogs, they have the claws, which add traction, and which is great for speed and mobility. And also they're able to like pin, pin things down, which they'll use for um, like holding a bone in place or, um, or catching, like pinning a bull if it um, pounces on a bull. The cats um, can use their paws are also used in that same way, but they also, um, protect their paws because they they use their hunt uh, the claw is very important on their hunting for hunting. So um, that is what they use to actually grasp the prey when they catch it. And then plant the grades um, mentioned that they're the slowest, but they have the probably the greatest abilities um, with their with their paws or hands. So um, they can actually grasp and manipulate items. 
So here's just a, comparing the, just a brief overview of those hoofed animals. Got the mule deer, elk, moose. Um, sometimes they are a little bit hard to tell apart. There is some overlap you can see on, in terms of size. Um, the smaller large deer and the small elk or small moose may be similar in terms of size, but the shape will be a little bit different. That mule deer is, um, has that well-known heart shape on it. Elk is a little bit rounder. Moose can vary quite a bit. Um, one animal that I didn't include in here, because um, they're a little rare, much more rare to see their tracks, is for bighorn shape sheep. But they're going to be a similar size to the deer, like two to four inches, um, but a little bit blockier and straighter side, straighter on the sides um, than the mule deer. Then the um, looking in this picture is the ungus is would be the outside of the hoof. So that would be um, the equivalent to your fingernail or toenail. So a little closer look at the mule deer. It's got that heart shape, um, heart shape, which we can see in that center picture. Um, just shows how much we love the mule deer around here, <laughs> or I am always, always love watching them. Um, and then the, that pointy tip indicates the direction of travel. So this one would be traveling down the screen, the one in the middle. The one on the upper left would be going up, and then the one on the lower left would be going toward the right. So, um, yeah, and then like most anim other animals, the front track is going to be larger than the rear track. The front, front end of an animal is carrying more weight. You know, it's got the neck and the head on the front end, so um, needs to have a little bit more surface area to support that weight. Some other signs that you may see um, from mule deer is that foot drag in, the, in deeper snow. So you'll get like these two parallel lines as you can see in that upper, upper level or upper photo. Um, eating snow is kind of little munchy image with the next to the deer track on the lower left. And then um, bed sites, um, usually under trees, because they get a little more um, protection uh, under trees, stays a little bit warmer. And then the, usually the snow is a little bit um, shallower also. Um, and then on the upper um, picture, you can see, or um, yeah, it's kind of a good image to see that deer are browsers. So browsers mean that they just spend a short time um, eating, feeding on one plant at a time. So here it's going side to side, going from one bush to the next bush. Um, and that way they never um, impact that individual plant too much. Just taking a few leaves or a few little twigs off at a time. Elk um, would be, a uh, much larger animal. So their tracks are gonna be quite a bit bigger. And sometimes, I don't think you can quite see in any of these pictures, but they may you may see the dew claws mark. And if you look at that center picture, upper center picture, um, you can see just above the hoof on the back side, those are the dew claws. And the dew claws, can give a little bit more support. Um, sometimes if, it, if it's running uh, um, really quickly, it may show, show also. And then in soft conditions, it, it may, um, may appear. So um, elk have a rounder shape, a little bit duller point to the end, as you can see in that upper left-hand photo. And then um, for bed sites, they could be either in, out in the open or under trees. Now elk um, are known as grazers. So they're gonna spend a lot of time, um, that's one of the reasons why they'll be out in the meadows a little bit more, but they'll, so they're gonna be out eating a lot of grasses and they'll scrape with their hooves, they'll scrape 
away snow off of the grass so they'll have better access to it. So um, here around the Estes area, probably we have a greater percentage of, um, of the bull elk. So the male, male elk will spend more time here in the winter um, than you'll see um, the rest of the year. Most of the cows and calves are gonna move to lower elevations where they have a little bit more dependable um, food sources. The largest of our ungulates here would be the moose. And they're sometimes are very tricky to identify. Um, you can't just go by size because <clears throat> the size does overlap quite a bit with, with the elk. Um, and, but the dew claws are gonna show a little bit more, more often. So you can see in the upper left-hand corner, um, the two little dots behind the main part of the track. Um, those would be the dew claws. And then in the um, lower, uh, the center picture, <clears throat> um, just below the moose scat, you can see um, the two little circles behind at the back side of the trap. Those are also the dew claws. Now you can see how, how different the tracks can look um, in that center picture on the left. Um, they're a little bit splayed, a little bit offset. Because um, moose have pretty flexible feet. <clears throat> and so that allows them to really maneuver through deep snow, soft conditions like you would find um, at the, in a lake um, or boggy, boggy areas. And um, one other way sometimes you can use to um, differentiate uh, moose from elk tracks is. Um, that their trails tend, tend to meander quite a bit. They're, they're browsers as opposed to the grazers that the elk are. So they'll go from um, tree to tree, bush to bush, um, and spend a little time um, feeding, feeding on, on those um, plants. Um, they're also very ad, ad, adept at moving through deep snow, um, over logs, um, over very difficult terrain that you normally wouldn't find elk in. And <clears throat> one other, I um, think I forget if I mentioned it or not, but on the um, upper right hand photo, you can see how prominent those dew claws are um, on, on this animal. They're much lower than on the, on the elk and the hooves are quite a bit um, shorter, also lower. Now, um, moose also spend a lot of time bedded down in the winter. Um, they have very little nutrition in the food that they're eating. So they're just spending, biding their time through the winter um, and just conserve as much energy as possible. So often they may be bedded down under, under willows or up, or not willows so much in the um, winter time, but in their fir trees um, where they're just very well protected. The next group of animals we'll look at is dogs and cats. So um, these are, um, since they're both have the um, sim similar shape as the pad, they're our, our um, track, they were pretty easily confused. And as you saw in that earlier photo, the, picture, the individual tracks can vary greatly from, from one to another. But in general, the cats are gonna have a much rounder shape. As you can see on the, um, two, the um, photo number three. And then they'll also be asymmetrical. So you can see on um, photo number one and three, how they each have a leading toe. If you look at those two center toes um, in the, toward the front, one is offset from or ahead of the other one. Whereas on dogs, they're gonna be um, parallel. You can see that on photo number four and two, those are both 
of canines, canids. <laughs> so um, another way you can look at, and it's pretty good indicator, even if you have a pretty poor shape or poor quality track, is looking at the negative space um, in, the, in the track. So that would be that space between that heel pad and the toes. So on the cats, it forms a very nice arc, so or a U, U shape, whereas uh, on, on dogs, it comes much more to a point. And so can you see that on these pictures here? And um, so you could see in the um, far photo, um, there's a pretty distinct um, trackle form like an X. So that'll be the um, part of the track that's um, raised. Another way you can tell the animals apart from dogs and cats is just looking at the trail that they make. So coyotes are very efficient travelers. So they're not gonna wander a whole lot. They don't really mind being out in the open that much. And so that would, a coyote made the top um, track in the path, um, path in the top photo. So there you can see it's a fairly direct path right through the trees. Um, a domestic dog, on the other hand, probably would have checked out every little bush along the way, um, had a much more meandering, me meandering path because um, they don't really need to worry about looking for food. You know, they always know that their food is at home. So cats, on the other hand, are ambush predators. So they're gonna be concealed as much as possible. So you can see in the uh, lower, lower photo there that they often will go from trunk to trunk just to stay that little bit more cover, um, cover. And, um, but they'll also may um, make slight detours to go to an overlook if there's a boulder along the side. I'll often see the, see the um, the cat make a little detour, look, um, pause at the top of that boulder, look around, and then go back on, on its way. So domestic dogs can be very difficult to de determine. So um, they can be, you know, they vary in size. As you know, the dog could be five pounds or it could be over a hundred pounds. And so, um, that'll, the tracks, of course, will vary um, greatly too. So, um, but there are some ways to distinguish a domestic dog from a coyote, which you might also see tracks of around here. The one of the, um, a, a few, besides the um, trail that it's going to leave, um, there are a few other characteristics of that um, domestic dog that may, get, may give you a hint of what it is. So they tend to have a little wider stance so, um, or straddle. So that would be, um, coyotes are very narrow animals. So a lot of most domestic dogs are gonna have a much broader shoulders. So they're gonna leave a wider um, track. Their feet aren't quite as strong either. So, um, they're gonna have a little rounder shape of the track and may splay the toes a little bit more too. They also tend to have heavier toenail, toenail marks, which you can see in this, this photo. They're pretty um, distinct um, um, nail marks in this that image. When I actually, on, on that particular track, I was following a coyote track or a coyote trail and um, notice, huh, these, this track here looks a lot different. And so it um, wasn't until I went a little bit further down the trail that I came across the dogs that, was, that had made those tracks. Um, let's see. And also, just in terms of the trail, they turn, tend to have less of a direct register. And what a direct register is, is that's when the rear um, footprint goes directly on top of where the front one was. 
So it'll look um, like there's about half as many tracks as there, there would be for feet, I guess you would say. So, um, so on, a, on a dog, that rear track, a rear um, foot may fall to the side or up in front of or behind um, that front track. Also, the heel pad, which you can, is much more prominent on um, domestic dogs than on coyotes. So the coyote, so if you kind of keep in mind that previous photo, you can see how, how different a coyote track is. Now, of course, coyote tracks like that mountain lion, they can vary quite a bit. And it'll determine on the pace that they're going um, on the snow conditions and the terrain, if it's uphill or downhill. But you can see it's much more of an oval shape. Um, you can, and also if you notice these two tracks, it's from the same animal, but they both look quite a bit different, especially if you're looking at that heel pad. So this one, the bottom track would be the front pad or front um, footprint. And the top one would be the rear footprint. So the uh, heel pad on the rear track is gonna be much smaller than on the front. Now, if it had a direct register, it would, the track would really look like the front track because it would show that larger track is gonna show, show up. And then the front track will just um, overlap sometimes perfectly over the front one. You can also see that the toenails on the, on the coyote, um, only the front ones are showing and they're very close together compared to that domestic dog. So the toenails, sometimes you'll see the um, toenails on those side pads, but as I guess you can see them just slightly on that rear track at the top, um, but they tend to tuck in and right next to those or right behind those front pads. Now, um, they're very efficient um, walkers and or trotters, so they can cover really long distances um, with um, little effort, seems seemingly little effort. And then they'll hunt in individually or in pairs, and you may see them also in packs. So if they're just going after small prey like a mouse or voles, um, they'll just be often just hunting individually. If it's something a little bit larger, like rabbits, um, they may hunt in, in pairs. So they may go side by side in parallel paths about 10 yards or so apart. And so then if one spots the rabbit, it may run right into the path of the other one. But they also can hunt in packs. And um, that you see, you don't see that everywhere. Um, but around here, you do see packs hunting together, especially in the winter time when those larger animals like the deer are a lot more vulnerable. So, um, and you'll see that a little bit more um, as the winter progresses, but it can be even after the rut, which we're just ending the rut. And those, um, especially the um, bucks are really tired. They've lost a lot of weight, spent a lot of energy, and um, just are not, um, many of them that I've noticed are limping by the end of the rut. And so they're just not able to um, elude predators like a coyote. So um, if you've a lot of tracks, if you just um, look at one track, you know, you can identify, sometimes identify or an animal, but if you follow the tracks, you may see that they actually can tell a story. So in this upper left-hand um, photo number one here, um, I came, was following just a couple um, coyote tracks. And then all of a sudden, eventually, or eventually I came into this and it was like, what in the world happened here? <laughs> and it turns out, it was a, like a coyote playground. So you can see um, where the coyotes had been rolling. Um, this for the view here, you can see like these spots like in this area. And then um, also you can see 
other places where coyotes have been running, running away from this spot, sometimes running in pairs. In photo number two, you can see how they were, um, there was a lot of slipping. Like you can see how the tracks on the left were all sliding out. And so um, what I think was happening there is they were grabbing onto each other. And so they were, um, as sometimes coyotes, so um, when they're playing, they'll grab each other by the scruff of the neck. And so um, they'll pull each other along. Photo number three was a different um, situation, but you can see a number of tracks. And here, they, um, there was another pack of coyotes, and I think they were ended up were looking for rabbits. And so this is, they came to a culvert. There was probably a rabbit underneath the culvert, and they were going side to side, trying to figure out how to get that rabbit out of the culvert. I think they ended up being unsuccessful and went off and hunted other rabbits somewhere else. Um, and then um, in the lower right-hand photo, let's see, I think we need, can we get some light in? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see. Let me check here. But um, both in that photo, we can look, get a little bit of an example of that um, double register. And so you can see here where the, where, okay, might work. You see, <laughs> excuse me here. So in that lower photo, you can see that the, um, there was a number of coyotes and you can see also how they use each other's tracks. Um, initially on the right-hand side, there was two coyotes following the same path. Then one um, moved over, joined the other one's tracks, and then eventually they all formed one line. Um, and so sometimes it can be very difficult to tell how many coyotes you're actually following when you see a set of coyote tracks. And you may have to follow it for a little while until one or a couple of them may um, separate. Oh, that was good. All right, sorry about, whoops. Um, one second here. No. <laughs> okay, we're getting closer. Um, all right, so let me um, go to just another, um, while we're, we're looking at those coyote tracks. Um, you can also tell um, about the speed of an animal from looking at its tracks. So um, one of the um, ways to, to look at, or to that's a good indicator of the tracks is just the speed between, uh, distance between, this, between the tracks. You know, as you're, if you're running along, um, the, the faster you're going, the longer your stride is gonna be. So there's gonna be a greater distance between the tracks. Here, um, the one tracks on the left, the coyote was in a gallop. And so it forms um, little groupings of tracks. So um, you can see here is galloping pretty fast. And then eventually it slowed to a walk. The um, ones in going up the center, um, that was going at an amble. So it's like a fast walk. And so in that fast walk, you'll have that um, rear foot overstepping the front. So instead of the direct register, that rear foot is gonna land in front of where that um, front foot was. You can also tell the speed of an animal as the width of the straddle um, or the width of the animal. So um, as you're walking, you know, your feet are fairly far apart. And as you, when you start to run, 
your track becomes much more narrow. So if you see like a really straight line, that means that animal's walking pretty fast. Um, just a, another way you can sometimes tell is the splay of the toes. So if the um, toes are spread apart a little bit more, um, that may indicate that it's running faster, uh, gets more traction that way, and um, it, it in, absorbs a little more impact. So next we'll look at the mountain lion. So that's gotta be one of the most exciting tracks that you'll find around here. And amazingly, they're pretty um, common to find um, especially if you're um, up on the hillsides, but they also come down into the valleys quite a bit too, because um, mountain lions, their primary prey is deer. And in the winter time, we have a lot of deer in town and in the valleys. So that mountain lion can have that round shape, asymmetrical um, pads, if you look at those front pads. And actually the back um, heel pad is also asymmetrical. You can kind of see at the at an angle. So um, another way to look at the pace of an animal is to um, look where that um, rear foot um, falls compared to the front. So the slower or faster it's going, that rear foot footprint will be in front of the back one or the rear foot will be in front of where the front foot was. So if you imagine going down a hill, your stride's gonna be a little bit longer. If you're going uphill, your, that back foot will fall um, behind um, the front, front foot. So as you know, going uphill, you tend to take much shorter strides. Um, so a few other signs are, um, this is, that you may see, um, uh, find from mountain lions is um, um, scrape marks, which you can see in um, photo number four. Um, another way you can see, tell a difference between a cat and a dog is a cat has no hesitation of walking over a down, down log like this one that you see in um, the photo number six in the lower right. Um, you can also um, see some stories if you follow the tracks far enough. So in site number one, um, I discovered this hill site. So initially I um, saw a drag mark. So this, if you look at photo number two, right down the center, of the picture, it looks like it, somebody went sledding. So that was where a mountain lion had dragged its prey up a hillside to catch it. So I followed it down the hill and that's when I came across that hill site. And by kind of doing bigger and bigger circles around that site, I was able to determine um, where the cat had been, where it, how it had made that ambush and um, with bigger circles, I kind of end up spending or seeing how it spent its whole evening that night and how, how far it came from um, and when it detected the um, herd of deer. So in photo number three, um, the, the um, drag mark ended up going up into some juniper trees and I did not follow it up into that, that area. Um, when I'm following tracks, I like to make sure I have really good visibility. I don't want to surprise or disturb the animal in any way. And so um, if it's in a situation like that, I wouldn't, wouldn't pursue it at all. Um, and then in photo number five, you can see what a cache looks like. Um, that one is actually a cache of an elk. And so um, the mountain lion in that circumstance had actually dragged the elk quite a distance, um, which is pretty amazing because the elk weighs several hundred pounds, um, quite a bit, many times heavier than, than a mountain lion. This is another, another story um, behind the tracks. And this, this one I came across um, 
a mountain lion track and then noticed that it had two other mountain lions with it. So this was a mother who was taking its kittens, um, kittens um, to a cache site. And along the way, you can see in photo number one, the um, kittens were playing. So you can see um, little bounding marks and then where you see the two, two um, cats um, went off and joined the mother along the way. Um, it was pretty remarkable. The mother kept the very direct lines from one side of the valley to the next and eventually took them to the um, cache site. And then when they were finished with their meal, they retreated up into the rocks. So next we go to the bobcat. So it's gonna have a very similar shape, but much smaller. So it's gonna be about half the size of a, of a mountain lion. Now there's gonna be a little bit of overlap between a, um, a mountain lion cub and a large bobcat, but you're gonna find them in very different circumstances. So the, um, the small mountain lion is just gonna, it's most likely could be with its uh, mother and whereas a bobcat could be seen, um, would be um, solo. So um, on the lower right-hand corner, you can see the common stride of a bobcat. They're usually almost always just walking. And so um, when they're walking, it's, it's often a steady pace. Um, tracks are very evenly distributed and they can, since they're walking, it means they just have one moving one foot at a time. So if they, um, they're always on the lookout for prey, so they may pause and um, just st stop in their place and then continue on their way. Next, we'll look at the black bear. Um, it's a pretty rare track to find um, in the winter time, but, um, but this one, past winter, I did actually find a, a bear that had gone out in February. Um, they're very human-like um, tracks, especially the rear track um, has, is a long shape like a, a human. And their walking pattern, their normal walking pattern is the rear um, foot overstepping the front. And sometimes if those two um, tracks are really close together, it can look like one long footprint. And so just yesterday, someone was asking me about what a Bigfoot track looks like, and so, or Sasquatch. Um, so most likely that was a track of a bear. <laughs> so the one, one um, kind of really interesting um, aspect, I think, of the bear tracks is they're almost like a backwards or, or reversed human track. So they have the big toe on the outside rather than the inside like a uh, human would. You can also see in that upper right-hand um, photo that their tracks can look very much like a pattern of a person walking. So um, in the winter, they'll often have a direct register of tracks so that rear foot will fall right on top of where the front foot was. So that's um, um, what you're seeing on that upper right-hand photo. Now, another um, common track that you'll see around here are rabbits. Um, we mostly have mountain cottontails, also known as the um, Nuttles cottontail. And they, rabbits have a very distinctive um, track pattern with those, um, the two front feet will land and then the um, back feet, which are the longer longer feet here, will um, land in front of where the front feet were. So um, those you'll also, sometimes you'll be able to see the um, pad prints, but um, rabbits have hair covering their bottom of their feet. So often you won't be able to see much. Snowshoe hares, if you're up in the little higher elevations, they're pretty common to see. Um, and it's really remarkable how common they are to see, given that you almost never see the hares themselves. Um, they're mostly nocturnal 
and they're well camouflaged and spend a lot of time undercover. Um, as their name implies, they have very large feet, so they spread their toes out and um, yeah, gives them extra flotation and soft snow. On that center photo, you can see um, what they're feeding on most of the winter, which is pine needles. Um, the next photo uh, animal we'll look at is the long-tailed weasel. Um, they're pretty fun animals to watch. Um, they're, they're very curious, and so they leave a very erratic um, pat trail pattern. Um, they're just looking for prey everywhere. And um, so they're um, bounding along, looking under um, from bush to bush under every log. They'll also travel inside other animals' um, burrows and in through their tunnels. And um, one of probably the most distinctive pattern, trail pattern, is when they make a short, short bound. And that's kind of as a dumbbell shape, which is you can see in um, photo number three. A little um, story or what you can learn from the uh, long-tailed weasel. In this um, photo, you can see one of their main prey items, which is mice. And so in the photo number one, you can see a mouse track to the right and then the weasel track on the left. And you can actually see that dumbbell shape um, track is that long, long track on the left hand side. On the right hand picture, you can see how a weasel ran out from the bush. And then if you look at that um, path on the right, there's a little line that is on the right hand side of that track. That's where it had caught a mouse and was taking it back to, the, to a safe place to consume it. And so speaking of mice, um, they're also a pretty common track to find. Um, sometimes they'll leave a tail mark. Sometimes they, they'll just leave that, you'll just see that little bounding pattern. They're pretty consistent. Um, they can um, travel pretty long distances and you'll see those bound marks are often pretty, um, pretty evenly distributed. Um, it's really risky for them to be out in the open. So they're often just going from bush to bush. Although in photo number two, you can see it was like, this was actually right down the center of a trail that I often go on. And it was like for this particular day, it was like a mouse highway. You can see that little zipper like line um, where a mouse was traveling or several mice were traveling. And every once in a while, one would take a little off ramp to one of the bushes. Um, another animal very, that looks very similar to a mouse is a vole. And voles, I'd say, maybe aren't quite as adventurous as mice. They tend to travel on the same, same path over and over. And so they'll wear a path like um, between two bushes. You'll see like a path through the grass um, can actually wear right into the ground. In the wintertime, those paths will be covered by snow. And depending on the depth of the snow, you may see um, the, the tunnel that they're making. So you can see that in the upper photo. Um, and then the larger tracks you see are of a coyote that just happened to pass over that path. Um, sometimes when they are out in the open, it seems like they get a little lost. And so I'm not really sure why that is, if it's looking for food. And like in this case, it was on a road. Not sure if they're looking for little seeds or something, but um, the tracks can be form pretty interesting shapes or patterns. Um, next one we'll look at is the pine squirrel. So they'll have similar pattern to the mouse. Um, you'll often find them going log to log or tree to tree <clears throat> in that hopping pattern. Um, and that's where they're, they're nesting. And they also spend a lot of their traveling is um, through the canopy of trees. So they're not always um, moving on the ground, but they do need to go to the ground because they cache um, pine cones and food for the winter time um, in, on the ground. So the last picture we'll look at, last track, is one that we often 
um, Macy in the in kind of woody areas. And so you guys have any guesses on this one? Looks not like it's got a lot of feet, <laughs> but this is one we often see on windy days. So it's actually, it's a ponderosa pine cone. <laughs> so that's always, they're actually pretty fun track or little path tracks to, to find. Um, and so of course, if you're looking at a um, pine cone from a Douglas fir or other, other um, cones, they'll also have that same type of look. So um, I use a lot of different references when I'm um, learning about tracks. These are just a few that are from my bookcase. Um, each one has its um, pluses and minuses. Sometimes you have to be really careful because tracks since they do very a lot, and then some tracks um, are just not very accurate, and there's some I you find some editing errors also, and you can especially find find that to be the case if you're looking for information um, on the internet, just googling. Often tracks will be misidentified. So um, that's what I've got for this evening. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And I think tomorrow we're gonna to have a great day for tracking. Just I think we got that like an inch of wet snow, which is like the perfect um, depth for finding tracks. Yeah, oh, great. Yeah. That was so, great, thank yeah. you. Do we have any questions? Okay. Nothing, all right. Well, great. I hope you all enjoyed that and hopefully oh, learned, learned a little bit. Um, one thing, yeah, I just love when you, yeah, okay. What is the most unique track you found besides the pine cone? Oh, the most unique track, that is a good one. Um, I'll have to think maybe, I know one time, I think last year, I found a track of a pine marten and it just had me stumped for quite a while um, to figure out what it had, because it has a different, very different shape. It's kind of yeah. an, like an angled, um, leaves an angled print, and then has a different shape on its heel, um, heel pad too. So that one was pretty neat. Um, but probably my favorite tracks are always finding mountain lion tracks, because they're just really interesting. And of course, always exciting when you, whenever oh, you yeah. spot one. As you know, there you see tracks out there a lot, and you just never see the animal <laughs> itself. Well, and when the snow melts, they get bigger and bigger. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you, and if it's like soft conditions, yeah. or like conditions like tomorrow, um, you know, where it's kind of a, a wet snow, tracks will look pretty big. Yeah. And maybe right. bigger than the footprint actually is. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that was great. Um, Thank you, everybody, for coming and for getting on the uh, Zoom call with us. Our January meeting is on January 13th, and that will be our local ornithologist, Scott Rashid, who's going to talk about his project over the uh, during the fall months of banding owls. Look for that. Banding uh -huh. owls. Oh, owl. All right, well, thank you again. All right, and I brought some of the resources if anyone wants to just take a, a look at the books um, too. Oh, good, thank yeah. you. What was the date of January? 13th, always on a Thursday. And he's, I don't know whether he's going to change the week or you. Yeah.